Imagine if we could teach so that 98% of our students would be above average. To quote, as Jay did, our friend Dan Gilmore, you know more than I do. Will Richardson should be up here instead of me. Well, the conversation should be happening there. To quote Jay Rosen, you Personalization is perhaps one of the biggest opportunities here as well because it provides us with the potential of solving a 30-year-old problem. Educational researcher Benjamin Bloom in 1984 posed what's called the Two Sigma problem, which he observed by studying three populations. The first is the population that studied in a lecture-based classroom. The second is a population of students that studied using a standard lecture-based classroom, but with a mastery-based approach, so that students couldn't move on to the next topic before uh, demonstrating mastery of the previous one. And finally, there was a population of students that were taught in a one-on-one -on -one instruction using a tutor. The mastery-based population is a full standard deviation, or sigma, in achievement scores better than the standard lecture-based class. And the individual tutoring gives you two sigma improvement in performance. To understand what that means, let's look at the lecture-based classroom. Let's pick the median performance as a threshold. So in the lecture-based class, half the students are above that level and half are below. In the individual tutoring instruction, 98% of the students are going to be above that threshold. Imagine if we could teach so that 98% of our students would be above average. Hence, the Two Sigma problem. Because we cannot afford, as a society, to provide every student with an individual human tutor. But maybe we can afford to provide each student with a computer or a smartphone. So the question is, how can we use technology to push from the left side of the graph, from the blue curve, to the right side with the green curve? Mastery is easy to achieve using a computer because a computer doesn't get tired of showing you the same video five times. And it doesn't even get tired of grading the same work multiple times. We've seen that in many of the examples that I've shown you. And even personalization is something that we're starting to see the beginnings of, whether it's via the personalized trajectory through the curriculum or some of the personalized feedback that we've shown you. So the goal here is to try and push and see how far we can get towards the green curve. So, if this is um, so great, our university is now obsolete. Well, Mark Twain certainly thought so. He said that college is a place where a professor's lecture notes go straight to a student's lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> I beg to differ with Mark Twain, though. I think what he was complaining about is not, is not universities, but rather the lecture-based format that so many universities spend so much time on. So let's go from back even further.
To quote, as Jay did, our friend Dan Gilmore, you know more than I do. Will Richardson should be up here instead of me. Well, the conversation should be happening there. To quote Jay Rosen, you are the people formerly known as the audience. Same can be said, I think, of the academe. Why in the world do we need thousands upon thousands, perhaps millions of instructors over time rewriting the exact same lecture on, say, capillary action? Why do we need that in the age of MIT OpenCourseWare and in the age of YouTube? We don't. It's wasteful, in fact. Um, so I think that educators, like journalists, as I advise journalists, need to become more curators than creators. The good stuff, in great part, is already out there. Why remake it except for ego? Now, the lecture does have its place to impart knowledge. It does create a, standing st a shared starting point. But it's not the be all and end all of, of teaching. It still has its place. But the shared lecture enables an efficiency to be found so that you don't all have to rewrite the same thing. And we need that efficiency in education today. It makes better use of precious te teaching resource. It highlights and supports the best, which is important in a link economy. You link to the best. Um, in fact, I argue in news, I'll argue the same in the academe. There now becomes an ethic that says, do what you do best and link to the rest. Yeah, it's great when it rhymes, isn't it? <laughs> You'd be so proud if it were in PowerPoint now, but aren't you glad you don't have one? I don't have one. And it was only at the end of the session, as I usually like to play Oprah and get down in the, in the pit, in the mosh pit, and that I realized what I should do. And I turned to students and I said, well, what do you think we should teach you? And the list of things that popped out like crazy was wonderful. It was both practical and visionary. So to start with the student. Now, students don't always know what they need to know. Granted, stipulated, Your Honor. But we can't know that until we listen to them first. Instead of giving tests all the time to find out what we taught them and did they get it right, tests should be used to find out what they don't know and need to know. Wrong answers in that case are opportunities and needs. The problem is that we start at the end. We proscribe and preordain the outcome. We have the list of right answers. I have it here. You don't. We tell them our answers before they ask the question. How useless can we be? We then drill them and test them. And if they don't regurgitate back what we told them, we say, you have failed. The system is built, again, for an industrial age, for the assembly line, for stamping out everyone the same, students as widgets. But we're not in the industrial age anymore, are we? We are in the Google age. 